development goals. And what we're achieving is widening. And we'll hear more about that from Dino in a moment. But even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the world was already off track in terms of achieving its education targets. So if no additional measures are taken now, only one in six countries will achieve universal access to quality education by 2030. So what can we do? I've got a fantastic panel. I rarely do this, but I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing as well. Muna. Muna Abu Suleiman uh, from Saudi Arabia. All my work, whether it was in the media, in philanthropy, or in VC investment as an angel investor, has always been about equalizing opportunity and giving a leg up to those who cannot have uh, the resources that they should uh, or would need. Um, so that's my life. I think a lot of people know me from my show, which was an educational show, Kalam Nawa'am. I was also the head of the Al Walid bin Talal Foundation. And right now, I'm a partner at uh, Transform VC. And from the name, you can tell it's about transformations. Mm. Excellent. Seema. Thank you. Um, we can hear you. OK. okay. Uh, so my name is Seema Hingarani. I'm from New York. I've been an investor for 28 years. And most of that time in the private sector, I spent about four years in the public sector where I was the chief investment officer of the New York City Pension Fund. And this is back in 2013, 2014. I saw a lot in that seat when you manage $160 billion on behalf of 700,000 teachers and firefighters and police officers for their retirement security. There were two things, though, that I saw in particular. One is I saw few, if any, women on investment teams at any asset manager all over the world. Right. And I was told by our industry leadership um, that we had a pipeline problem. So I started a nonprofit organization eight years ago called Girls Who Invest, which is an educational curriculum followed by a paid internship at a leading asset manager. We're in our eighth year, put thousands of young college women through mm -hmm. our programs in the US. Um, and then I since started a fund to invest in women mm -hmm. and people of color wanting to start their own investment funds which is what took me to Morgan Stanley, where I am now. OK, fantastic. Dino. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dino Varkia. I'm the chief executive officer of GEMS Education, today the world's leading K-12 education company. For over 65 years, we've been driven by a very singular purpose to try and put a quality education within the reach of every learner. And today, we have the privilege of educating almost 160,000 students across our schools uh, in the region. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Edie. So I want to ask you guys, in your experience, how as human beings do we learn? We'll start in reverse, Dino. You know? Well, let me go to current theory. Current theory would suggest that there are probably six or seven learning styles. You know, mm -hmm. a person can be a visual learner, a verbal learner, kinesthetic or physical. They can be a logical learner, social, solitary. So give me an example. If, I, you're, if I'm a teacher sure. and I'm teaching six different kids who have six different ways of learning, what subject? Give me an example. Well, it's incredibly challenging. Look, if, if you're a visual learner and as a teacher, you will want to be able to try and use elements of imagery and or presentations to try and ensure that the student is engaged and interested. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a logical or a mathematical learner, the nature of the topic that you're teaching will need to have some elements of patterns and or numerical okay. components mm -hmm. to, again, inspire a level of curiosity in the student. Mm. It isn't that you're one or the other, but you yeah. will certainly have a dominant type. But I do need to caveat, we still know so little mm. about how our brains actually work. Interesting. Seema, in your experience, you've done online and in-person learning. How are the students, the young women that you're working with, who are at university level, how do, how do they learn the best? So we focus on students who are in their first and second year of university in the US. So they're young, they're 18, 19 years old. And we target women who specifically have never looked at a financial statement before in their lives, don't know anything about accounting. In fact, we don't. We tell them you don't need to know anything. I didn't know anything when I was studying right. uh, in college about what it was to be an investor or about finance. Um, so, it's, so we knew that we had to do a certain level of technical skills training to help these young women feel confident so that when they go into these internships at some of these leading firms, 
where honestly they're with a bunch of men uh, that, that they're confident. And so, but you know, it's not enough to teach them the technical skills training. I think it's easy to teach someone, again, a little bit about accounting, how to read a financial statement, build a financial model. In fact, AI could teach us a lot of those things. But it's the other elements of building confidence. So we do presentation skills training. We do interview preparation training. We do business etiquette training. I mean, think about it. A lot of these young women that go through our programs have not eaten at a restaurant with a white tablecloth. That's mm. not how they grew up. So we have somebody who comes in and teaches them that this fork is for salad, this spoon is for soup, this glass is for water. Um, we teach them what to wear, what not to wear in the workplace. Um, because this is Wall Street, and you know, you have a certain, a lot of these young women also a have look. a certain impression of what it, it's like. Right. And movies out of Hollywood called The Wolf of Wall Street don't help. <laughs> and so we have to do a lot of these other kinds of trainings, which honestly, it's, it's not as easy to do through just technology. Mm. Tell us, uh, Moon, in your experience, how do people learn, children learn? So I think this is a very important question for a couple of things. So there's a lot of stuff we don't know, but there's a lot of stuff we do know. We know that by the age, before the age of 10, kids learn best in, uh, in person. They learn best in a collaborative environment. They learn best with a structured pedagogy uh, approach. And so there are things that we know. And yet, sometimes with technology and excitement and decision makers maybe not being always interested in a child's well-being rather than making money, they're mm -hmm. pushing a lot of technology at younger ages. So we're seeing, uh, from my point of view, higher rates of anxiety, ADHD, uh, um, and other issues uh, related to educational learning styles. And we're not finding people to solve the things at the root. Rather, they say, oh, you have ADHD? OK, well, I'll get you an app to help you with your ADHD. You're getting anxiety? Well, there is that app that helps you with meditation. And I'd rather that we step back from technology a little bit and figure out what we do know and, and look at the things we don't know and devise something that is seamless. So technology or edutech falls into three different um, mm -hmm. sectors. So students, right, edutech for students, things that helps them, gamifying, all these kind of things. The support for teachers to help the students and administration and online uh, learning. And all these three are very, you know, different tracks. Mm. And sometimes they uh, mix the teacher administration or teacher help with the student uh, at UTEC. And therefore, you're not getting the right support. You get complicated stuff for the children. Right. And you're not getting the right um, information for the teachers. So um, separating some of those capitalistic uh, mm. behaviors in, in selling uh, software to ensure that the end, what we have is the well-being of the teacher and the, and, the, and the students. You invest in different kinds of, yes. of education technology, some gaming in investments, yes. right? Does that work? Does gaming in education work? So we do know, for example, that when you're teaching a child to create new neural links, it takes 400 times of repetition, different types of repetition, of course, and, and not all of them at the same uh, level. But at, at play, it takes 20 uh, repetitions for somebody to understand it. But at the same time, so gamifying, we have EGL, which is Educational Generative Learning. Uh, it's a company that we're investing in. Mm -hmm. um, it looks at where can we gam gamify some things. So for example, there is this um, software called Times Table Rockstar. It teaches kids how to do uh, the times table, and it gamifies it. Mm -hmm. And they've actually looked at when a child does it as an extracurricular activity on his own at home versus when he does it in school with a guided you know, uh, process from the teacher, and he's competing with people that he knows and trusts. So it's not with people he doesn't know uh, on a game uh, right. platform. Uh, there's a 65% increase in his learning. Hmm. And so games work in some things, and they don't right. work in some things. Okay. And this is one example where it does work. So, Dino, before we get to even higher tech solutions, I want you to um, 
talk about the scale of the global challenge. I mentioned it at the beginning, but actually it started even before the Sustainable Development Goals. Tell us about that. Yeah, when we think about the old Millennium Development Goals, it provided a framework for uh, or target for education that was purely about access. So purely about ensuring access to education for all. At that point, the global teacher shortage was only 7 million. Mm. As soon as we transitioned to the Sustainable Development Goals, the target was reframed to include not just access, but access to quality education for all. As a consequence, the global teacher shortage is 70 million. Mm. And that's just the core foundational issue that we have. And the previous panel alluded to it, but I thought I'd dimension it with some numbers. It's all been exacerbated by what we also consider COVID-triggered learning loss and the learning crisis that's been created. Because today, if you look at the latest World Bank report, this generation of students risks losing $21 trillion in lifetime earnings. Mm. So for me, as we talk about upgrading human intelligence, the reality is there is an economic, social, and frankly, human imperative for us to be able to address this crisis and this challenge. So what low technology solutions are there? Have you seen? Look, um, yeah, I mean, we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. But before that, look, if you're still thinking about trying to get access to quality education, uh, our foundation, through the work with the development organization in the UK, funded programs and delivered programs in rural communities in Ghana. All it required was a single studio in the capital, Accra, three highly qualified teachers who were beaming into multiple classrooms across Ghana, was educating 10,000 girls each and every day, English, math, and what I would consider sort of female role model as a subject, or role modeling or empowerment as a subject. Um, not very costly. Uh, how were you getting connectivity into those villages? You were using something called VSAT, so very small aperture terminals, which basically got internet connectivity via satellite. So again, when you think about that, that isn't high tech. Mm. It's just a solution that can potentially be scaled, has an right. incredible amount uh, of potential uh, applications when we think about students and or children displaced by conflict. You've done some work with, with a company that looks at teachers and getting their yeah, So there's to... a lot of low tech things that you can do. So um, uh, Dino is talking about creating channels for which also happened in some places in the Middle East, but for example, in Sierra Leone, that wasn't even available. We had to go with radio, right? It was actually over radio that we would transmit mm. the, the lessons. But um, the second thing is I think we need to reinvest in teachers, uh, pay them a lot better, uh, give them the support that they need, have teacher assistance, and really, because that's, I think, for me, the pivotal low-tech uh, solution. Right. right. Uh, but one thing that we did do uh, is there's an Armenian, uh, if, I'm sure everybody is aware of Salman Khan Academy. Um, something very similar to Salman Khan, but it's actually about looking at the curricula and looking at each part of a subject. So for example, let's say again, multiplication, figuring out who is the best teacher that actually does that, taping them. So it could be somebody from anywhere in the world. Uh, with the AI, you can translate everything that they say to whichever language the student is learning in hmm. and provide that over mobiles. Uh, and so you're getting the best minds in every single you know, part of uh, a curriculum. Every different subject, every, even within a subject. You can within have a subject, lecture. you don't have the same teacher. Right. Um, Fascinating. So we're here at the Future Investment Initiative, full of people, SEMA, that need the skills that you're teaching these young women. Besides those hard skills, you alluded already to teaching them what for. What about, what, else, what about communication skills? What else do you find that these young women need? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the idea that, you, could, you know, if you need to solve a math equation, a physics equation, AI can actually help you with that, right? But when you think about how do you relate to people, how do you 
address a boardroom? How do you sit at right. the table, uh, at a board table? Um, those are, I would call them maybe intangible things, but they are so important and mm. critical to getting business done. And especially at any decision-making tables, no matter what it is, whether it's business, politics, medicine, law, it doesn't matter. And so what we do in our program is we actually teach these women, when you walk into a boardroom, what do you do? Just envision what that will look like. And, and you know, have people raise their hands, I don't know, we do this or that. And really what we say is, and I say specifically is, you know, you wait. See where everybody sits. Because I bet you that the head of the business probably has their seat. And that person has their seat. And the last thing you want to be is one of those annoying interns that sits in somebody's seat <laughs> and you get your head ripped off because you didn't know what you did. Right. Um, so these things seem like small things, but they're actually major things. Mm. And that is hard to get when, again, you're just doing an online yeah. tool or you're even teaching, again, the mechanics of how to build a financial model. Right. So these are the kinds of things that we spend a lot of time teaching our young women. I have to say, though, going back to what they were saying earlier, in COVID time, we had the option to either not do a Girls Who Invest program, which would have been devastating, or to do it, our on-campus curriculum, and do that online, mm. which is a, it was a really Herculean effort we thought, because we had never done that before, and a lot of our business school professors had never taught online before, mm. which was interesting. And so then what was happening, too, is that we take a lot of foreign national students in our program, even though they study in the U.S. So now you have women, young women, that have gone back to their homes mm. all around the world, and they're logging in to this curriculum that, again, though, has these other elements of community. Right and these softer skills, and I was afraid we were gonna lose all of this sense of community and the ability to teach softer skills online and on Zoom, because it basically was on Zoom. Yeah. And it was amazing what we saw happen, and that gave us hope for being able to scale what we do on a larger mm. level, which is exactly what we're trying to do. So we've dealt with low tech, let's go to high tech. Do you know how can schools incorporate artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think certainly artificial intelligence and machine learning can be a critical enabler and catalyst to address and meet SDG4. Uh, whether it's building uh, virtual tutors, uh, intelligent tutoring systems, personalized learning pathways, personalized assessment and feedback tools, or a combination of all of them, which I think of as the holy grail of education, which is an AI-powered adaptive learning engine. The reality is, while there's lots of solutions on the margins, a comprehensive solution does not exist today that can be provided at scale to every student in every corner of the world. Because it's hard? Because it's hard. Expensive. At least today, it will be expensive. So how, how can you scale at pace and make sure that it is affordable and or accessible mm -hmm. to every child? I don't have the answer to that yet. I don't think very many people do, but it is an answer that we need to be able to find very quickly. Right. So yeah, the holy grail is, is AI personalized uh, tutors that would mm. work with the teacher to enable the person to learn uh, to the best of his abilities. So I have two problems, um, actually. One, and I love what you're doing, Seema, by the way. I'm, I'm like, I'm already like going to contact you. I have a, a, a hundred girls that can go through your uh, program. Thank you. <laughs> love that. But one is that we forgot that to learn is not just about knowledge, but there's a process of thinking, and it's a hard thing. There's a, re a reason why um, you have to brainstorm for ideas to write an essay that is part of a thinking process that you mm. learn. So if you use AI to give you ideas, you're already shortcutting your right. um, uh, learning uh, journey and in a, a very negative way. So the reliance on AI, I think, is uh, going to be 
because everybody wants mm -hmm. to have a, a better grade, right? So this is going to right. be very easy. And they're or going to spend be, less time working, depending or spend on. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, so this is why I think when you're older, when you've graduated, when your brain has finished developing, I think AI will become an amazing personal mm -hmm. assistant, but I'm afraid of the usage for it for children. What, how, can we, how can teachers, how can we use AI to support teachers if that's where we need to put some more yeah, support? So, yeah, so how to be able to evaluate a student to understand where they're struggling, where the issues are, and then give the teacher different learning uh, styles of uh, reaching him and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And, but it has to be behind the scenes so the child doesn't feel like they're becoming a robot. Mm. Um, also, human capacity. So our children are not computers. They need downtime, they need play, they need other things. So we get caught up with this idea of making them as competitive and we're seeing the result now with a lot of burnout for kids uh, at a very young age. Mm. But if we look at technologies that I would love to see, um, I think one of the best things that is not happening yet is historically accurate games. Mm. So learning history and literature and sociology and psychology and bringing all these things together through a game that the children will play, again, guided by a teacher in an environment where they know and trust their students, mm -hmm. so it's not open, but it has to be historically accurate. So you learn about the medieval ages and the different ways that uh, they are seen, whether from a Western perspective mm -hmm. or Eastern perspective, because you're being given different yeah. roles. Um, but you also learn about the psychology of how a person would feel like at that mm -hmm. time. This kind of investment has not happened. Mm. Um, and, and it's hard because gaming companies want to make money, right? And, and, so, and they want to make it too exciting sometimes. Right. Too many too many deaths. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about the curriculum. We're running close to our time. Seema, how do you work out the curriculum for the students that are taking your courses? How often do you revise it? So um, there are parts of it we don't revise very often. Um, there are certain things that accounting. Right. You got to learn. You start getting creative in accounting, that's a bad thing, generally. <laughs> so. Definitely some films about that. Yeah. So, uh, so there's that. But then, um, well, there's clearly newer technologies uh, in, in finance that right. where there's real investment to be made. Crypto, as an example. We brought that into the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, you just need to understand what it is. You need to understand the risks of investing in crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there are a lot of young people generally, I would say globally, particularly in the US, that were trading crypto and didn't really understand it and right. lost a lot of money. And some, some younger <laughs> people actually uh -oh, one's suicide here. and it was just awful, right? So we want to teach them the basics of certain things like that. So those things are new. AI, frankly, how to think about investing in AI, mm -hmm. uh, and you know how are how are companies trying to figure that out in the asset management community? Um, so so we try to stay current okay. on certain things. So Dino, do you think schools, in your opinion, are able to keep their curriculum current enough? I think education is notoriously slow to adapt to, frankly, what is an unprecedented era of rapid change that we all find ourselves in. Um, mm. I'll give you guys two examples. Uh, Python, computer programming language, invented in the late 80s, uh, incorporated by Microsoft to build Windows early 90s. The first time that it was part of a core curriculum and actually tested in school, 2016. 3D printing, mm -hmm. invented late 1980s, 1988. First time that it was again embedded into, actually it still isn't part of core curriculum, it's supplementary to design tech, 2016. We're talking about a quarter century innovation lag between industry or cutting out research and where education is today. Now, again, for me, we can talk about AI, we can talk about the real potential that it unleashes for us, but frankly, we need to figure out how to reduce that innovation lag between core education and cutting edge research and industry. And to be fair, that, that is only, that's gotta be one of the key ways in which we try and, again, upgrade human intelligence, as the panel says. Interesting. We're out of time. I wanna close with a, um, a quotation from Martin Luther King who said that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. 
Intelligence plus character, that's the goal of true education. So I, have a, I really hope that you've enjoyed the intelligence and the character of my fantastic panelists here today, and I thank you all for coming today to hear them. Thank you very much. Thank you.